Hi, my name is Stuart Lewis and I'm the founder of Restless, the rapidly growing digital community for the over 50s. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Andrew Scott, co-author of The 100 Year Life and an esteemed economist, professor and author who specialises in the topic of longevity. Now in 2016, along with Linda Gratton, he co-authored the global bestseller, The 100 Year Life, which has had a material impact right across the globe, including being a bedrock for government policy in countries such as Japan. And um, as you might expect, it's also been a huge source of inspiration for us here at Restless. Andrew, it's a real pleasure to be speaking with you today. Thank you, a pleasure as well. I think what you're doing is great. I love the site. Thank you, thank you. So, so the launch of the 100 Year Life created a, a surge in interest in the longevity space across the globe. Now, for me, what was so profound was how it helped change the central narrative around aging and longevity, away from the doom and gloom of how governments could not afford to support an aging society, into this idea that, that longevity should be a wonderful gift that should be embraced on both a, an individual and a societal level. And for, for me, this is so powerful. What prompted you and your co-author to write the book and, and where did this central thesis come from? Yes, I'm a, a macroeconomist and at London Business School, which is where I work, I, I give a series of talks or lectures on the world economy, sort of short and long run prospects. And for years, one of them I would do was an aging society. Uh, and you know, you'd be familiar with the story, the birth rates declining, more people are living for longer. And I used to hate giving this lecture because you know, I've been reading about it since I was an undergraduate and I'm 55. So we've kind of known it's coming, but it was just a totally miserable lecture. It just says, oh goodness me, there's too many old people. Old people are a problem. They get ill, they don't work, we can't afford them. Uh, and there's gonna be a real drag on everyone else. So that's pretty miserable. Uh, and then I, you know, I quite like economics because it's, well, one of the reasons I like economics is it kind of tries to find surprising angles, but there was nothing here. It was just like, it's all miserable. And then, you know, I looked at the key statistic, which is on average, we're living longer and we're healthier for longer. And you think, well, how have we turned this into a bad news story? And of course, what I realized was it's kind of the demographers who are saying the birth rate's declining and they look at a change in the age structure of society. There's more old people. And if that was the only thing that was happening, I guess, you know, I get why they were concerned. But of course, if how we're aging is changing, if we are aging better, and that's kind of what the data says, on average, we're living longer and we're healthier for longer. That's fantastic. This is one of the greatest achievements we've had in the 20th century. So that got me thinking about a longevity dividend. So there's more old people and how we're aging is changing. And the more we can maximize that second one, then the better it is for us as individuals, for society and of course the economy. So uh, Linda and I were uh, on a tour with London Business School, flying on various planes, etc. And I just said, yeah, I just don't think governments and people have got this right. She said, corporates don't know what's happening. And so we wrote The 100 Year Life. And, you know, it has been phenomenally successful, which is lovely to see. And I hope it's because it's a great book and it's well written. But I think also, you know, the timing was such, we'd heard this aging society story for so long. And people said, you know what, it's, it's operating differently. There's something else. And I think that's what we picked up on in the book. One of the other huge success stories of The 100 Year Life is how influential it's been right across the globe. So, so with Japan and Singapore in particular, embracing many of the ideas of the book in Japan as a, almost a national rallying cry. Um, now, what lessons are there to be learned from other countries and how older people and their experiences are embraced in the workplace and society? I think it's really so it's a, a good question. And of course, you know, governments are very keen on a more positive agenda around this topic because uh, you know, otherwise they have a very difficult agenda. So trying to get people to seize the opportunities is great. And of course, countries like Japan and Singapore who have got a lot of very old people and have aged very fast are very much at the forefront. So there was obviously very fertile ground to pick up on it. Um, and you're seeing around the world this big experiment, but I, there are some interesting differences. So different countries pick up on different things. Uh, so in the UK, it was sort of uh, certainly sort of people in the 40s and 50s going, wow, how do I prepare for the next stage? In the US, it's kind of the 60 year olds, you know, do I retire now or a bit later? And in Japan, there was a lot about older people, but actually a lot of younger people too got on it. Because for me, you know, we, we are so confused about concepts of aging. You know, everyone's aging and everyone's aging the same rate, one year every year. Uh, but we kind of immediately think of aging as being old. And of course, the key thing about long, living longer is in a sense, you're, you've got more time ahead of you. You're kind of younger in a way. You know, the average Brit has never been so old, but never had so long left to live. And that's at least ambiguous about whether it's really an aging society. So different countries picked up on in different ways. I mean, clearly, 
you know, one of the starting points of the 100 year life was if you're living for longer, unless you're prepared to spend less every year, you're going to be working for longer. But of course, you can't carry on doing it in the same way. It has to be different. And the countries like Japan and Singapore that you mentioned are very successful in accommodating older workers. I think that's key. But I, I do want to stress that, you know, this once you start thinking about longevity, you realize it's not just about end of life, it's about all of life. And just as the 20th century, we saw pensioners and teenagers created. They didn't exist before. We're seeing whole new stages of life being invented. So we're seeing people in their 20s behave very differently. And then, you know, I think in this interview, we're going to focus on the group 50 to 70, because that's particularly where the most recent gains in life expectancy have come, creating whole new possibilities and options, as well as challenges. But, you know, it's like a new, you know, the years of life that we've been added haven't really come at the end of life. They kind of come at the end of middle age, whatever that means. And that's really interesting as someone who's 55. C completely. And it, for me, it's that golden opportunity. So kind of something something's particularly relevant for our members is this idea of reinvention and transition yeah. in people's 50s and 60s. Kind of ex exactly as you say, this idea of late life where we become frail um, has remained broadly the same. The ideal of childhood stayed the same. There's perhaps more technology and TV these days, but it's the same. The same with education and families, but it's that what Susan Flory would call the big middle, um, this expanse of those in their 50s and 70s living in predominantly good health, that is such a golden opportunity for, for, for many. I mean, to, to your point, like, wh have, have, you, have you had multiple career changes and what, what ambitions do you have? It's always a slightly awkward question because I'm an academic, so uh, I'm not sure I've had a career, let alone many of them. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, in a way, the university world is lucky because you can kind of switch your focus and it's a trivial one, but yeah, I mean, I have had the opportunity to live in different countries, etc. cetera. Um, but it, it, me getting involved in longevity is a, it's a sort of a, a kind of a big career shift. Of course, I'm still doing ideas, but most of my early work was around monetary policy, fiscal policy, and business cycles uh, so this is a, a whole new topic for me and, and creating a whole new identity and meeting with a whole bunch of new people uh, so professionally there's been some changes and then of course in your personal life you have changes too I mean like many I have been divorced etc uh, but looking forward it is interesting I, I think for me it's sort of planning you know that for me the big insight for longevity is everyone at every age has got more time ahead of them than past generations so you have to be more forward looking and that involves more investing in your future self, uh, health wise, financial wise, skill wise, but also thinking, well, actually, you know, how do I keep a sense of purpose? What do I want to be doing in 10, 15, 20, 30 years time? And of course, you don't know, but you've got to make sure that you keep evaluating your current position quite a lot. So, yeah, I'm doing a lot of that, particularly during COVID. Yes. Yeah. And this, this idea of purpose is so central to, to why we set up Restless, actually. And the, the, the idea from, from my own father is that retirement was not all it was cracked up to be. I think many yeah. people can, can struggle going from five days a week for yeah. four decades through to, through to nothingness. Yeah. Um, so whether that, and that, that sense will be very different for everyone whether it's travel or yeah. not in today's world, but whether it's exploring, whether it's workplace, whether it's having a kind of a social purpose through volunteering or what have you. But it's, exactly. it's very I think, Yeah. And, you know, the research, there's a number of research papers that show that if you're not doing manual work, the longer you work for, the longer you live. Now, I, I don't think, I, I mean, I think, and this will come on to about the new book, The New Long Life. I think we, you know, one of the things about a hundred year life and technology is we have to think more broadly about what we mean by work. So work won't just be clocking in and getting a paycheck. And that's obviously very important. But you know, work is going to kind of be time spent with some productive purpose. And as you say, it could be charity, it could be spending time with your family, it could be investing in friendships. But that sense of engagement does seem absolutely crucial. C completely. One of, the, one of the statistics we pulled out uh, last year was around that one in, nearly one in two of all self-employed individuals were over 50. Yeah. Um, and again, to that idea of this different sense of what, is, what does my sense of work and purpose look like now? Yeah. Um, c completely. So, so a number of people in the, the longevity space are talking about this idea of a midlife MOT. Um, kind of touching a little bit on the, the points of transition you were talking about. What do you think of this? What do you, and what did, do you think some of the different aspects of life people should consider? I think it's great. And I think uh, I'm a massive fan of it. And in fact, 
I'm trying to work with, well, I'm talking with City Lit, the London-based adult education group, to try and see if we can't do something similar outside of an employment situation at low cost for many people. Um, so Mark Friedman, who's a very inspiring figure who runs Encore.org in the uh, US, says we don't have a midlife crisis, we have a midlife chasm. We don't have institutions that support transitions and reinvention. And a midlife MOT doesn't have to be about change, but I think, you know, the problem we've got is that we're, you know, all of us are living longer than our parents. You know, our life expectancy is probably you know, seven to ten years longer than our parents, and on average. And that means you've got to be more forward-looking. But you know, if you think, if you if you say to a twenty-year-old, "Hey, plan your, you know, how would you want to spend your life?" and you've got no one to look at, you wouldn't know where to begin. So we have these social norms that help us structure our life, and some people reject them, but by and large, we follow these social norms. And of course, you look at your parents and your grandparents, and they're going to influence you in whatever way. But of course, with these longer lives, you can't. You've got to do something different. So I think the, the great thing about a, a midlife MOT is it just takes you to have stock of things like actually I've got to keep going for do I have to keep going for longer work wise do I want to change my job what's my finances what's my relationships what's my purpose uh, so I think they're great uh, I mean I, I think of course the principle can be used at lots of different points in life but I do think that's a great time 50 because that's also the point where you see people starting to withdraw from the labor market and not often out of choice so I think uh, that's the other challenge um, you know, it's a group that I think is most vulnerable economically. Um, and you know, what, what this longevity channel that I focus on is about is about kind of malleability. What you do now can influence the future. And those 50 to 70 years are really important ones for employment, for finances, for health and relationships. So great idea, great idea. And the, the interesting you talk about the health as well. I remember the Centre for Aging Better did a lot of research around the importance of strength and balance and building that in your 50s and 60s for yeah. later life in terms of preventing falls and, and so yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, to me, the big, the big insights I get, and I'm talking as an economist from this sort of longevity perspective, is this notion that age is malleable. Uh, now, not you know, the scientists will say they're about to take it to another level, which may or may not be the case. And I don't mean that you can you know, be as fit as a teenager in your 90s, but you know, there, there are things you can do to influence your future path and some of them are under your control. Um, and then that also means that kind of life becomes recursive in the sense that actions today have consequences for the future. Uh, and that's true throughout all of life and the earlier you start, the better. But I think there are certain times and, and this one we're talking about is a key one. And I think, so, so touching on this topic of positivity again, I think the power of a positive approach and outlook is so important, um, and so crucial in all aspects of life. Um, I think one of the challenges for this demographic, and you talked about it with, with the sense of um, ageism there, is it's, we, we see ageism as rife in both society yeah. and the labour market. And it can be difficult for people to see the positives in that, in that back, against that backdrop. I mean, can you, can you offer any tips or suggestions on how people can switch their own narrative of their own ageing and longevity yeah. into a positive? And, and you know, this is a re and undoubtedly there's profound ageism in, in society. And I do worry about COVID because we're going to see a rise of unemployment. We'll see a rise of unemployment amongst people over 50. Yeah. And particularly in getting a job, there's lots of um, ageism. So let me sort of do two things. One is in a minute come to, yes, there's ageism and here's how to be more positive. But also I'll be positive by saying let's not overdo the ageism um, because 100% uh, of the employment growth that's occurred in the G7 countries the last 10 years has come from people aged over 50. So there's, wow, that's something. There's something happening already. Uh, I think it's really interesting what's happened during COVID because we have accepted to trash the economy to save the lives of many older people. So society is saying, I, I value these people. So you, and then you've got Colonel Tom Moore and Dame Vera. I mean, it, there's lots of positive. So it's not completely negative around uh, um, aging, uh, even though there is undoubtedly is. Um, and you know, so therefore, how do we change the narrative and how do you individually be positive? At the individual level, I think it's to recognize that although there's some things out of your control, there's many things that aren't. So you have to be careful your own language and the own ways you approach certain topics. But just keep investing in yourself because by and large, I think in one of the challenges of a three-stage life of education, work, retirement, is we become very age segregated. And that means you don't mix with people of different ages. 
And I think that's really important because when you mix with people of different ages, by and large, everyone seems to benefit. But also you yourself, I think, keep to you know, have new ideas and keep being uh, refreshed and purposeful. I, I don't want to trivialise ages in a society, but I think there are things you can do. And then, you know, the other challenge is that even if there is ageism in the workplace, which there undoubtedly is, um, there are, you talked about self-employment, I think one of the reasons why that's so pre prevalent amongst 50 plus is it is an opportunity that you can use. Yeah. Now, it may be one you'd rather not, but there are advantages to going down that path. And I think that's going to be a really big one over the next decade or so. Uh, I, I agree. And it, it's that double-edged sword. So you have a rise in kind of midlife entrepreneurialism, actually, where people want to show what they can do and are very successful at it. But you've got the, the other end where people are struggling to find employment, so they're forced down that route. Yeah, but it's, um, yeah. it really is a, a double-edged sword. But on that one, I mean, I, I, so I think if you look at, say, the gig economy, you know, this sort of contingent work, what you find at all ages is about, I forget the exact point, but some people say it's great, it gives me flexibility and purpose. Others say it's terrible, I hate it, I want to get a proper job. And we have the same situation over 50. And I think, to me, that's one of the issues, actually. I, I'm keen that we don't all the time refer to the 50-plus market. Sometimes it's useful. But actually, the 50-plus market is like the under 50-plus market. There's a lot of diversity. And some people are in good jobs. Some people are in bad jobs. Some people are struggling. Some people aren't. Uh, and you know that diversity is key to what is happening at older ages. Not to deny there aren't specific issues. Uh, and by the way, sir, how old are you? Uh, so I'm, I'm closer to 40 than 50, but I've become fascinated by this space. And I, I've seen some of the, some of the transitions and, and challenges that come up, uh, come through much earlier in people's careers with yeah. people I know. Um, one, of the, one of the questions I was going to talk about, actually, that's quite close to my heart, is this idea of um, peak role. So, and this idea of the intersection of age and hierarchy in society. Yeah. So, so, so in, in my experience, what we see is society is great at respecting age in the workplace when people have followed linear career paths yeah. um, through to FTSE 100 CEOs, but very, very few people can do that. Um, and this idea of kind of what happens post peak role is society's demographics are like this, whereas the hierarchy of corporate hierarchy is more like this. Yeah. Um, right. And, and ONS data shows that salaries peak in people's 40s and kind of invariably the, the killer, killer challenge that people come against is being told they're overqualified. Like we had a story of a finance director who was um, literally changed her job title to be admin manager so that she'd get interviews. Um, and it's quite, quite tragic, really, right? Because yeah. the mm -hmm. roles that people should be able to do really comfortably and they're having to downsell themselves. But I'd be fascinated in your thoughts on how we challenge those stereotypes. And yeah, and isn't it interesting how, you know, historically and still today, so many titles have, you know, senior manager, senior consultant, uh, a hard baking that notion of age, which then leads to problems of um, overqualification too. Um, so, yeah, and, and you're drawing attention to what, what I would say the combination of a three stage life, education, work and retirement, and then a linear career path. And you know, we're talking about a multi-stage life uh, where you're gonna have three or four different stages to your career, each with different motivations. One may be a full-time job, one may be focused totally on money, one may be social purpose, one may be entrepreneurial, gig economy. I mean, there's just all sorts of different combinations. And that is inconsistent with the notion of a, a linear career path. And then as you say, there's sort of, um, uh, you're also gonna get a sort of a blockage at the top as well. Uh, I mean, I kind of, Think of this as the Prince Charles effect. I think he's 71. He still hasn't yet become the monarch, uh, which is truly extraordinary. So, how, you know, what do you do while you're waiting to get those jobs? And it goes right the way down. This is this key thing about longevity. It changes everything because if I join at 20 and I know I'm not going to be with you until retirement, then I'm thinking about this differently. If I'm in my 30s and 40s and I know that I'm not going to be able to carry on in this job because I'm going to get bored or technology is going to come along or I'm going to get kicked out. I start thinking about something different. And so individuals are way ahead of the corporate sector on this. And, and that, that is going to be inevitable. So how do you change it? Some firms are beginning to change. And you mentioned things like Midlife MOT and there's a whole bunch of firms of Viva, Liga in general, Barclays, who are trying to take steps. Um, and I think sometimes they're doing that because it's, they feel it's the right thing and they have a responsibility to their, their workforce and society. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, there's going to be a smaller demographic group coming along. 
So then it's going to be, well, where else do I find uh, uh, people? And then there's a, an aging consumer base, which is going to require people um, to understand that much better. Uh, and you're an entrepreneur who's recognized this largest emerging market that there is out there and understand that market's going to be key. So there will be changes that will happen. Um, and you know, I go back to that point about over the last 10 years, 100% of all G7 employment growth was a 50 plus because it was a tight labor market. Unemployment was yeah. low. Where do I get these uh, older people? Uh, well, employers, it's the older people. And again, this brings you to back to worry about COVID because there's going to be a concern that older people are going to be more vulnerable to illness and need to be protected to the higher cost. I've got really high unemployment and people will focus on those who are uh, the youngest. So uh, this, is, this is difficult full stop, but I do think firms are beginning to realize diversity. Uh, we know that diverse teams are more productive. I think they're also beginning to recognize some of the sort of age stereotypes are wrong. And, you know, I think there's, there's kind of three things here. One is what I call age inflation. So sort of 60 is the new 50. I mean, 60, by the way, is really just the new 60, but you know, we, we can call it 60 is the new 50. Uh, so people don't seem so old. Um, uh, then um, uh, you've got diversity. And the key thing about aging is this malleability, which means that people age very differently. And so, and we know that, I mean, you know, you say, oh, you look good for your age and you shouldn't be doing that at your, we just know there's this malleability in age. And so I think that's breaking down some yep. stereotypes. I mean, we talk about uh, um, Colonel Moore as well. Um, so, you know, there's, um, there's a number of things going, I think, sort of a, a, a driving this, uh, which will be improving, but it's going to happen too slowly for, for people, that's for sure. Uh, sadly, I, sadly, I think you're right. And just to touch quickly on a couple of points you talk about there. So one is this, it, it, we've been gradually decoupling chronological age from biological age for quite some time. The NHS has been very big on it yeah. until COVID arrived. And as soon as we, we saw the first ageist glimpse of policy where we're talking about locking away the over 70s um, by a specific chronological age, we've seen for a long time. And I think we've, we've seen that on the front lines actually with to this other point around people unable to judge the differentiation with age. So often people are lumped as an over 50s as a homogenous yeah. group, which they're anything but, because they're unable to determine the difference between someone who's 51 and someone who's 81 and someone yeah. who's 91. Yeah. And, and we've, we've seen companies to talk, we've seen companies talk to us about being worried about the vulnerability mm. of our audience. What is extraordinary about COVID is how it is advancing two trends, technology and how we work remotely. And how do we look, have a healthy economy and a healthy population with an aging society? If you look at the fatality rate from COVID, it, it almost exactly mimics all causes of death. Um, and it's like, like a viral attack of aging. And of course, with that has come a, a reinforcement of sort of old people who are frail and need protecting. Um, and it is very complicated because it's clear that older people are more vulnerable. And what's interesting too, I think, about COVID, I mean, this is extraordinary, horrible thing, but multidimensional, is it, it, it actually seems to be linked to age in a way that's over and above sort of existing health conditions. So the longevity scientists are really interested in this because it seems to operate through some of the pathways that aging itself functions. So lots of negatives to, to focus on. Um, but then, in, you know, the, the NHS has been very clear, we are not going to restrict healthcare because someone is old um and i think you know this is how we begin this dialogue and debate and process of change and so i do think there's lots of positives that emerge from that um it, even though you can see absolutely ageism and age stereotypes at work but they're being challenged and you know at the beginning of the crisis there were some people who say oh why are we trashing the economy just to save old people they're going to die soon the, the whole aging society narrative but they really haven't got much traction or, or much of a platform. So I, I would cling to the positive, even though it may not be happening at a pace that we all want. I mean, it's going to depend on your situation, uh, but uh, I, I would cling to the positives. Uh, totally. And I think when you look the, the workforce cliff you talked about due to demographics, yeah. is still going to arrive. It's just going to be two or three years pushed back because of COVID. Um, I do worry. I mean, I think, I, th I think for me, if I think about the longevity gen, there's kind of two things. There's, there's health and there's work. I mean, there's relationships, community purpose, but if I think really about the, the levers that are important for the government, 
and you know i always say there's sort of two things you want to worry about one is life insurance uh, and investing your health is the best form of that but you also have to worry about longevity insurance which is sort of outliving your assets and outliving your sense of purpose and as we live longer that longevity insurance becomes more important and i i do think that the covid has made both the government and individuals more aware of the need to invest in the health to prevent themselves getting ill, which is absolutely something we need to do. But on the employment side, I think it's going to, you know, the, the impact on life expectancy, I think will be quite modest, but it's going to run people's savings down. They may lose their job and their need to work for longer is increased, but in an environment where we're going to see a high unemployment rate. So I think that to me is, you know, I've always felt that if we really want to seize a longevity agenda, we have to be able to support people so they can carry on working between 50 and 70 uh, as much as they can in good jobs. And that is absolutely paramount, but I think it's become more difficult because of COVID. So organizations such as yours are crucial because you're there providing, you know, awareness of courses, awareness of jobs and what people options have got. And, and that is key because we don't know how to make this work. So we need to find out and get social pioneers and copy and mimic them. And that's why we need sites like yours. One other thing you've talked about in the past that's really close to, to my heart, actually, is regarding the gap in life expectancy and in particular the gap in healthy life expectancy between the richest and poorest in society. Um, and, and this for me is an equality gap that's being exacerbated by the current pandemic. Now, now what, what I find so fascinating is that this gap implies we already have the knowledge and scientific capability to dramatically increase life, average healthy life expectancy simply by replicating best practice. I mean, what, what do you think some of the key pillars of any roadmap to, uh, to tackle this inequality of ageing should be? Yeah, I, and I, I completely agree with you. And, and you know, what I think is interesting about COVID is we have proved that we are prepared to incur costs of billions of pounds in order to save lives uh, and to keep people living for longer. And the same standard should be applied to narrowing that inequality because we should be prepared to take major steps to do it. It's just wrong in a democracy to see this widening health gap and longevity gap. And of course, as you say, it proves that age is malleable. You know, it's, it's not random that this is happening. It's socioeconomic determinants that are clearly at work. Now, um, it also should be, I, I think as a government, we should focus much more on measures of healthy life expectancy. And if we did, we'd focus on closing that gap a lot more because it's going to be easier to close that gap than to give more years of life to those already uh, benefiting from long lives. Completely. Although I do sometimes wonder if it may be easier for the scientists to come up with cures for aging than it is for society to tackle some of the social determinants. Um, in the US, there's the Case and Deaton book on deaths of despair. And I think you know, it's, it's not the only thing, but public health is really important here. And this is, I think, not about hospitals, it's about our life and our environment. And having a sense of purpose, involvement, a share in the economy, a share in prospects, it's absolutely crucial. So it's a combination of public health, education and information, but it's more than that. There's something going awry, I think, uh, at the moment in society that not everyone feels included. And that, I think, are always struggling to get included. So to have a meaningful purpose or job, which provides a clear sense of identity and responsibility is really important. Um, uh, and you know, something's happening and we've seen already with the Black Lives Matter, some of the issues about how people are just marginalized and not included. And I think if we could have a healthy society, particularly with technology and longevity gains, two things are required. The first is that, everyone feels they're getting some gain and benefit from society, from the economy. The second is everyone feels they've got a, a voice that will be listened to in deciding those decisions. And I think the inequality we've got shows on both counts that isn't happening. Uh, it's why, you know, in a way we come back to new long life. How do we construct a, a world for everyone that we can flourish, that people are all gaining from the economy and all for being listened to politically. So I think ultimately that's how we're going to have to do it. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think in, in Barack Obama's pre-election book, he talks about a democracy being more than majority rule. It's around how do you look after and yeah, have an inclusive society. And yeah. I think now more than ever, we're seeing the need for that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, it is, I, you know, it's, it's something like 14 years life expectancy gap, even between, I think, North and South Kensington. And certainly the US data bears that magnitude out. And mm -hmm. as life lengthens, the inequality is getting larger. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that's not right. 
and then just the, the final question for you, um, Andrew, is kind of about your new book. So um, what prompted you to, to get back together? I think it, um, with, with Linda Grattan, it, it, I think it was written pre-COVID, and yet yeah, the title okay. could not be more, uh, more adept for, for, for a post-COVID world. So it's, it's called uh, The New Long Life, A Framework for yeah. Flourishing in a Changing World. Can you tell so, us yeah. a bit more about the book? Okay, yeah, if you, if you, if you insist. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, I mean, first of all, I'm, I just get, find this longevity topic more and more interesting. There's so many different dimensions to go into. There's the economic, the social, the philosophical. So it's an endless uh, topic of interest to me. So there's always more to write and more to think. So the new long life draws deeper into the whole longevity aspect. Um, so I guess the origins of the new long life came from the 100-year life. We were talking about longevity, working for longer. And one of the things everyone said was, yeah, but where are the jobs going to come from? Technology is going to come along and smash everything. So that was, I think, where we thought, well, actually, there's going to be inter there's an interconnection between AI and robotics and longevity. And not just AI and robotics can help people work for longer, or it might discover a, a cure for aging, etc. Um, but, you know, the, these two together are going to transform careers and work. And, and put simply, AI and robotics, you know, we don't yet know if it's going to cause mass unemployment or not. But it's certainly going to lead a lot of churn in the labour market and how you do your job will change if you, you have to learn new skills. Longevity says you've got a longer working career. So in a way, your career's got longer, but the chapters have got shorter. So it comes back again to these transitions. And so the book is about how technology will impact the labour market and work-life balance, how longevity does exactly the same and how the two come together and what you need to do to prepare yourself for this but also something more fundamentally different, which is to say, you know, we, we worry about demography, we worry about technology, but I call it the Frankenstein syndrome, this fear that they're going to rise up and cause problems to us. But if we're smart enough to add years of, to life, and if we're smart enough to come up with these new technologies, we should be smart enough to make it work for us. So what do we want to achieve from this? If machines are becoming more machine-like, how do we become more human, which ultimately must be the gain of a longer life? And not just what do you need to do, but how do we need governments, educations and firms to change to support us? I'm a firm believer that if we let technology uh, and ageing society be driven by companies and governments, we will not get good outcomes. So it's, as with the Industrial Revolution, it's going to be a social narrative, civil society that says this is how we want to use these things. These are the opportunities. So it's kind of starting that narrative. And as you say, kindly, I mean, we wrote it before COVID. And when COVID happened, you think, oh, goodness me, a positive long run book uh, in a time when everything is incredibly negative. But COVID is many things, but it, it has accelerated trends around technology, working from home. and brought to the four issues of an aging society and it's acted as a stress test and revealed where we are lacking and that of course is exactly where the new long life uh, comes in and i think the other thing going back to people who either are already involved or who may be coming involved in the activities on your site you know what has happened is we've all realized our vulnerability and fragility to suddenly losing our job or suddenly being ill and you know that's of course been a huge blow to those on low income but even those who are quite prosperous and enjoying a job suddenly go oh my goodness i haven't got enough money to last more than a few months my job could disappear and that is exactly the threat that you're going to have if you don't invest in your future skills think about what's happening to the labor market so i i think again we come back to transitions and shocks and how you surf them and how you prepare for them and so COVID has been, uh, yeah, something of a, um, a major a stress test. No, and I, I, per, on a personal note, I very much look forward to, to reading your, your, your next book. Um, if it's anything like The 100 Year Life, I think it will be hugely insightful. Thank you. Hugely powerful.